Hey everybody, welcome back to S'mores and Dwarfs. I'm Corey. Hope you are all doing well in this uh, couple days before Thanksgiving here in 2021. Now here on S'mores and Dwarfs, you know we've been around a little over a year and um, I am very thankful for all of you that have watched our channel, all of you that have subscribed, uh, bought a shirt, bought coffee mug, whatever you've, you've done to help the channel along. I I greatly appreciate it, and I'm also thankful for those that uh, come along and and allow us to interview them for for our channel. Uh, you know, one of the things I think we do pretty well here are interviews, and um, I want to share one with you today that we did last year. It's uh, it's been played on the channel before, but I did want to replay it because it has a little historical significance um, this month, actually. So on November 14th of 1986, a little movie uh, was released that uh, pretty much became a sports classic. It starred Gene Hackman, Dennis Hopper, Barbara Hershey, and it's a movie called Hoosiers, directed by David Anspaugh, and written and produced by Angelo Pizzo. Now I was lucky enough last year uh, to interview Angelo Pizzo uh, to talk about Hoosiers and talk about his career in general. And um, today I want to replay that that interview for you. Um, you know, in respect, a show of love for the movie Hoosiers. Uh, we get some good behind-the-scenes stories about Hoosiers in this interview, as well as some of the other stuff that uh, those guys did, including Rudy, which is another another huge sports movie that I know a lot of people love. So. I hope you, if you haven't seen this interview or heard this interview, I hope you do enjoy it. And um, again, I want to thank uh, Angelo so much for being on the channel with us last year. He was a pretty early guest for us and a, you know, a pretty big name in my opinion uh, as well. So um, guys, hope you do enjoy this interview with Angelo Pizzo talking about Hoosiers and the rest of his career. Thank you. But uh, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, your career and, and uh, things like that. So I want to start, though, early. Um, you know, what, what were some of the experiences that you had? Or maybe maybe there are specific movies that you watched when you were younger that kind of developed an interest in, in filmmaking for you. Well, I mean, it's a, it, it was a long uh, story in a sense, uh, but uh, um, it's... You know where 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 my love of movies first manifested was probably watching the late shows on on uh, the the movies the older movies like the John Ford westerns right. um, on television and then when I was allowed to go to the movies myself and of course this will indicate how times times have changed I was probably eight or nine years old when I could go to movies by myself. And where our house was in Bloomington was uh, about 10 blocks from all three of the theaters downtown. Right. So I would just make a, a kind of a rotation of whatever new movie was were there. And uh, I, 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 my dad remembers me uh, going sometimes on Saturday around noon and watching the same movie about six or seven times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my love of movies really happened early. Uh, uh, but my, I guess, passion for, for movies began probably when I was 13, 14, 15. Okay. And those were the years where they, uh, they made the great epic uh, uh, films. Uh, some biblical like Ben-Hur or El Cid um, and uh, uh, West Side Story, but my favorite movie of all time is Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. And uh, now, uh, moving forward, just uh, to, to put it all into context, I never really thought about movies as a career um, at all uh, growing up because I, I knew no one, uh, I had no role models uh, that were identifiable and um, or known personally. Uh, and so uh, I just uh, always thought of movies as an avocation, not a vocation. 
Right. So when I went to college, I my my degree was in political science, and and I was going to go to law school. I was going to either diplomatic school or law school in in Washington D.C. and and probably and and uh, try for a career in in politics. Right. Uh, and then a little thing called the Vietnam War got in the way of that and uh, kind of blew up my world. And then I, uh, you know, kind of got lost for a, a few years between my undergraduate and graduate years. And it was at that time that I kind of uh, just had to make a hard decision about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And uh, my dad was very encouraging of following uh, the things, trying to create a career around something you love. Sure. which means, you know, uh, getting up every day and looking forward to going to work. And uh, so he uh, supported and uh, encouraged and uh, allowed uh, three years at USC uh, film school, uh, graduate school, uh, to, you know, get me to the uh, create opportunities for myself to start a career in the film business. Right. That's great. Um, I want to go back a little bit. You're talking about kind of growing up there in Bloomington, which I, I just, I love Bloomington. It's, you know, I've been to a lot of college towns, a lot of college campuses, but it's pretty unique. I think um, what makes Bloomington a special town for you? Well, I mean, I'm biased. I grew up here. <laughs> and then to give you a, another sense of the context is I went to Indiana university undergraduate school, as I mentioned, USC grad school, and then I, uh, I stayed in Los Angeles, the, the various areas of Los Angeles I lived uh, for 30 years. Right. And when um, it, in 2005, I had two sons who were 10 and seven, and we were becoming concerned about um, how, the, the nature of the, the school choices that we had in Santa Monica. Right. Which were either the public schools were pretty awful and the private schools, it wasn't their expense, but it was the, it was a, a, a I guess, made up of mostly celebrity sons and daughters and elite. Okay. <laughs> and we just didn't think it was a healthy environment psychologically right. uh, for our kids to grow up there. So we moved back to Bloomington in, uh, in 2005, and, and I've been here ever since. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a great move. And the things that I appreciate about Bloomington, I, I really only got a sense of, of what they were when I left it. Sure. And, um, and I was able, and I've been able to compare it to other college towns uh, of its ilk, uh, especially Big Ten college towns, because I've been to every, every university town in the Big Ten. And um, I think in part is the combination or the balance between a uh, town and gown. It is the, the number of, 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 uh, of of uh, normal citizens who are not connected to the university and the university. Right. So uh, the average age in Bloomington is 21. Mm -hmm. Now you won't find that in any other Midwestern city. Right. Uh, and, and that creates a kind of a vitality and an energy and a hopefulness and an optimism because people's lives are just starting. And, uh, and, and, um, and, and it's, a very, it's very much of a company town as opposed to um, Madison, for example, or Columbus, they're just really big cities with big university in them. But, uh, you know, they're different worlds if you live in, in, in whatever section of Columbus. It's, it's, it's just, it gets lost. Kind of like Austin. I spent uh, a year in Austin uh, mm. five years, four years ago making a movie. And, and Austin used to be kind of a college town. Now it's just, you know, University of Texas is stuck in the middle of a... <laughs> right metropolis of around 2 million people. So um, I, I really do think it's, it's a kind of the perfect balance between uh, the population is probably, I think it was 85,000 Bloomington and uh, there are 48,000 students. So yeah. that's a good balance. Right. right. That's the fact that it's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful, oh, yeah. beautiful campuses. Uh, it was my playground growing up. Uh, I also think, uh, you know, it has the, the luxury of having two of, of, of high powered Big Ten, uh, now a football team and uh, now a yeah. football program. Of course, basketball is uh, it's, it's just fun to participate in all of the university events. Um, and, and, and speaking of the university, the other um, the other thing that was 
really appealing to, to my wife at the time was the number of cultural opportunities offered by the university. I mean, it's a world-class institution, one of the best music schools in the country um, and uh, has uh, Broadway plays and operas and ballets coming through a world-class cinema and, um, and various uh, intellectuals, lecturers, uh, performers, uh, giving you access to things you never would have unless you lived in a big city. And even if you lived right. in a big city like we did in Los Angeles, it's a big, I mean, you have to get in the car and de deal with the traffic for an hour. Yeah. Each day. <laughs> and, uh, you can get everywhere in Bloomington in like 10 minutes. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I could go on and on uh, about it. And uh, I'll just add one other thing for a town of 85,000. It's pretty amazing. There are 75 Asian, Asian restaurants in this town. Oh, wow. So uh, the, the, the choices, uh, the, the eating dining choices are, are, are really broad ranged and, and, and significant. Right. So I, I want to talk about uh, your time at Indiana and um, that's where you met kind of your career partner, uh, David Onspa. Uh, of course, you both went to USC as well, but uh, you know, over the years, that relationship, that friendship, how did that develop into the working partnership you ended up having? Well, uh, as you mentioned, we met each other. We were members of the same fraternity. He was a year older than I, I, I was and, uh, and still is, by the way. Uh, and uh, we, we just hit it off. I think in part was because we our shared love of movies. He was a, he was a passionate movie devotee as, as I was. So we, we, we went to movies together, the special screenings on campus. And uh, we actually started talking about making our own movies. And David had an old Bolex 16 millimeter camera and he started shooting films. So I was involved in, in, in helping him and in, in making films. I mean, uh, and uh, it was just, it just became part of our, our passion. So he graduated, I stayed another year and uh, it, it was, he, he moved to Aspen in part to teach there in part to ski there and end up uh, working for the Aspen Ski Corporation. And when I graduated, I, I, I went out there and I joined him and I skied uh, most of a season in 1972. So, uh, and then at that point, that's when I kind of decided I had to, I could have easily gotten lost in, in the Aspen, Aspen ski culture uh, <laughs> for a very long time. But, uh, you know, I, it became uh, very apparent to me that I needed to make a life choice decision in terms of career. And that's when I, um, I flew home and had a long discussion with my dad and ended up applying for, to USC and going there. And then when I went to USC, I was talking up the, the film school with David all the time. And um, he's through circumstances I won't get into, uh, not because I don't want to, we probably don't have time. Um, he ended up uh, coming out there and going to grad school as well. So we had always talked about someday making a movie together and someday making a film about basketball in Indiana, because that was right. one of our discussion points about the Milan story. What would make a great Indian, what would make a great Indiana movie set, a great movie set in Indiana? And that was always at the top of the list. Believe it or not, another was something around the little 500. This is way before breaking away ever happened. Right. And uh, so we, uh, uh, I, uh, to, to fast forward very quickly, we maintained really close friendship uh, during that time. I mean, I was practically the only person he knew when he moved to Los Angeles. And, um, I uh, got a job out of film school and worked as a producer's assistant for six months. And then I went on a series, got involved in a series of jobs that were, uh, were, were so beneficial, so educational. Uh, I worked as a supervisorial producer. I worked as an executive uh, for some bigger studios. And um, I worked with some great filmmakers and um, learned how to feel comfortable in, in taking on a, on a role myself. And so what I decided to do was to uh, write, um, write a script, 
uh, that was based on on the Milan story and uh, and they, and I gave it to David. And I said, let's team it up. Let's get this done. Let, let's make it together, because subsequently he had started to work in um, uh, television, uh, 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 scripted episodic television, and worked as started as an associate producer and end up getting a number of different uh, gigs to direct. And I, he had directed like twenty different episodes of. Uh, shows like Hill Street Blues, um, Miami Vice, uh, St. Elsewhere, and so, and even won an Emmy for one of his Hill Street Blues. So um, uh, we were, we, we decided to team up then. All right. Well, I, I want to talk uh, obviously about Hoosiers and um, that Milan story. Um, it's such an iconic story in kind of Indiana basketball lore. Um, but were, was there, you, I know you said that was kind of the top of the list. Were there ever any thoughts of a different story that to go with in that script? Uh, well, we were the, all the stories that, that we talked about doing uh, in, in part because I was a huge sports fan because I, and, and I, I was thinking about developing these various projects when I was an executive because mm -hmm. I was in that power uh, position of power to do so. And uh and I actually got the go ahead to direct the, uh, the to develop the um, the the bas Indiana basketball story, the high school basketball story by the president of the company I worked for. And I, I started looking for writers uh, to, to write it. And I, I wanted to find somebody from Indiana. And I got a lot of the agents sending me sample scripts and I read a ton of them and none of them really felt right to me. And uh it was just so happening that the company I was working for is called Time Life Films when they were making feature films as well as television movies and whatnot. They had to disband their production wing because of an antitrust suit. And they uh, utilized, they, they broke up their assets and put it into HBO and then TriStar. Okay. And uh, I was offered a job at HBO or I had a contract, they paid my contract out in full. And, uh, you know, I, if, if I had gotten along with the president of HBO at the time, I might've taken that job, but we didn't hit, we didn't see eye to eye in just about anything. So I decided to take that, um, that little financial gift of a, you know, settlement for my contract and, and write the, write the Hoosier script on spec. Right. Okay. So I, I, um, uh... It's kind of funny the memories you have over the years, but a few years ago I was up at, at Bloomington and photographing the Indiana Purdue football game. And uh, the game wrapped up in the early evening. I was driving home and I just turned the radio on and found a just a random high school basketball game on. And it kind of gave me that uh, comforting or peaceful feeling on that drive home, which is kind of the same feeling I get watching Hoosiers. It's so, it feels so Southern indiana to me you know just watching that movie um and i'm sure a lot of people have that same kind of emotional response to it is that a challenge to kind of write something that elicits a, a response like that without going too maybe overly melodramatic well um i think there's a bunch of questions in there uh right. <laughs> i'll try to separate them out um uh, one is it's difficult to write any script uh, it's it's always difficult to uh, realize your intentions as a writer because your your idea of, and your thoughts about what that movie should be and what kind of uh, feelings it, it should evoke, uh, you know, is a it's it, it never reaches the bar that you set for it. Right. So uh, and 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 the part two of that that question was. Um, well, let me go back to part one only insofar as I had never written a script. Right. So it was kind of, and I, but I had worked with a lot of really talented, uh, successful writers in the process of that six year executive supervisory producer kind of roles that I was doing. But uh, also, uh, it still didn't matter. If you, if you haven't, you know, when you sit down and you face that blank piece of paper, sure, there's, there's nothing more horrific. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and I, I, I'll also say that I probably read a thousand screenplays before I wrote my first scene. Right. And uh, uh, it still didn't help me, uh, you know, because I think in order to write from an authentic emotional place, 
you can't write from an analytical place. You, you right. can't, like, I, I suppose if you're putting together a very um, specific plot driven, not character driven movie, you can like move characters around like chess pieces and, and, and you can do that kind of outlining. But I found that when I tried to outline the story, I didn't know who the characters were, so I didn't know what they were going to do. I didn't have a feel for it. Right. And I only got a feel for it when I started writing and their dialogue started to emerge. And, um, you know, it's an old saw that if you make a connection to the characters you create, they'll help you tell the story. Right. And I'll, give you, I'll give you a little example of that, which is um, conceptually uh, on, on the rough outline that I had that I end up throwing away. Uh, I, I had, uh, I was trying to figure out a way for the coach to get, become close to the players. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the ways in which I thought of uh, was to have one of the kids father be a drunk and not there, not available for, for the kid. So, so uh, the coach would function as a surrogate father, so to speak. Right. Um, so I only meant that character to be a device. And this was like, I think, I was 30 pages in, in, in the screenplay and I decided to have, have that character kind of stumble out and, and, uh, and, and cause the disruption and embarrass his son. And it was how the coach was going to manage that, which was what my focus was. I didn't really think about who that drunk was. Right. He was a generic drunk. So, um, but somehow, uh, and this can happen in, in a serendipitous way when you're writing is there was a connection made between uh, that character shooter and the coach. I, I found that, you know, I thought about it later and it, and it was that um, they saw each other's shadow. Uh, if you understand the concept, they, 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 they saw each other's dark, they connected subconsciously to each other's dark side because each had a dark side right. and they both had a passion for basketball. They really were a variation of each other. They were a version of each other. I think that Gene, in a sense, was, I mean, Gene, that guy kind of mixed them up now. The coach um, was, was a very close cousin in, uh, in a conceptual way to that character. So I realized I had to bring him back and that I had to develop that relationship further. So I just uh, experimentally um, came up with another scene just to see what they would be like in, a, in the diner. And of course, that scene right. is there. And then kind of that character of Shooter just wanted to take over the whole script. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he became very assertive. It became very powerful uh, a presence in the script. And he helped determine how that movie turned out. Now, if I'd written strictly from an outline, that character never would have existed. And of course, you know, the great irony when I, when I talk to screenwriters about this, don't get too locked into your outlines or don't even do an outline. Actually, I have a version of an outline, which I think is, you could sum up in about, uh, I think I think an outline should be no longer than maybe 10 sentences in one page. That would okay. be my, um, it's like creating a roadmap from going to New York to Los Angeles. You want to know the cities you're going to stop by. Right. Long, just so right. you, you don't want it to go over a, a territory that's totally unknown. Anyway, um, so uh, the, the, the kind of the subset or the irony is that here is a character I never, con never considered putting in the movie 30 pages into it. And he ended up, this character ends up getting nominated for the best supporting actor <laughs> in, in the Academy Award. So right. you, you just have to be open to those kind of things that happen. Now, the second part of your question, which was um, uh, the... Uh, the emotion or emotionality uh, uh, that that uh, that we aim for, uh, and, and and someone described, uh, and, and it's always a it's a very fine line, okay? Right. right. Where where and people draw that line at different places. You know, it's like it's almost like some people think some things are funny, and and other people don't think it's funny. Right. What some people think is corny or sentimental in a negative way. Sentimentality is, is a, a pejorative version of the word sentiment um, is different. People draw different lines. Says, oh God, you know, and the reviews uh, show that as well as in Rudy too. Yeah. I mean, we got, we got a ton of, and, and the last film I did, um, My All American, 
it's the same variation of the reviews. People either give into or go for it or connect to the, the emotion that we uh, attempt to create, or they, they step back from it and push it away and, and feel it's too manipulative, too corny, too sentimental. So we're, we're always aware of the, the, the how fine that line is between sentiment and sentimentality, but it's still our taste. And, right. uh, and, I, and I could tell you that um, there were many times when we worked, when we were working on Hoosiers, where David and I were have a clash about that. You know, because we were not the same people, and we would we would draw lines in a different way. Now, I'll give you another example. Working with one of the greatest uh, considered considered the among the top five composers to ever live, film composers, Jerry Goldsmith, who is nominated for an Academy Award for his score for Hoosiers. When we were in the the recording studio doing various bits uh, in in you know sections. Um, there was one time that he was playing, it was like a sectional game. And, and I, and I, I, I really had a problem with how big it sounded. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I went to, to David and David agreed. And we went to Jerry and said, it's too much. You know, we got, we have nowhere to go with this. It, it feels like, do we have to have, you know, all 40 strings playing, you know, when, they, <laughs> right. you know, it's like, so he cut everything back and, and, and we modulated, he took a lot of stuff out, both in Hoosier and Rudy that we found out that's, that was the way to work with him. He would always go big and, and kind of expect uh, the, the uh, filmmakers to dial it down. Right. <laughs> that was always an instinct because he was a very feeling person. Sure. And he would, uh, uh, you know, compose in, in a way that would um, express those emotions. Right. Well, you talked a little bit about the characters on the page, but uh, let's, let's touch on the actors that portray those roles. Um, you know, Dennis, Dennis Hopper and Gene Hackman are, you know, a lot of times considered two of the greatest actors in their generation. Um, but you said in a past interview that, you know, neither one was a very hot commodity coming into the film. Uh, but what, what did they bring to the, the movie that made it such a special film? Well, uh, Gene is simply as you mentioned, one of the greatest actors uh, working in the, our time. He's retired now. Right. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were very lucky to have uh, uh, got him when we did because he, he had had a, a, a big success, a series of su successful films nominated for Academy Awards. French Connection was probably the height. Mm -hmm. then he took... I think he was in like seven movies where he was the kind of the lead actor and all of them tanked. So right. his career was in a kind of a, it was in, in a, uh, he tried to go from character actor to lead actor and uh, because it worked for uh, Popeye in Popeye in uh, French connection where he played Popeye Doyle. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it was, it wasn't like he couldn't get work, but, uh, I think there was something in the, in the, the film that, that obviously worked for him, but uh, he, he wasn't terribly happy about what his situation was in his career. And, and, and he was, uh, he, he, he was pretty, look, the fact is that the character of Norman Dale was, um, had a significant dark side, obviously a temper, but, um, you know, he was a depressive, too. I mean, that was pretty clear. And this is a guy who probably had to deal with his own demons all the time. And that was that was Gene. Uh, and uh, obviously, he must have seen something himself uh, in that right. character. He was also grew up in Danville, Illinois. Okay. And that's right across the border. Um, and so he understood these small towns. He understood the people in the town. There was a connection, a relatability. Um, I can't say he was the easiest person to work with because he, um, he did not feel comfortable with our lack of experience. David never directed a feature. I'd never produced or written a feature and we were running the show. I mean, we had an independent financier who never showed up on the set. So we had free reign to do whatever we wanted to. That was the good news and bad news. It was not, it was bad news for him. It was very, made him very uncomfortable and also made Barbara Hershey very uncomfortable. They were not, uh, they were not thrilled about our amateur status and they're <laughs> all. 
Uh, on the other hand, Gene uh, or Dennis was, uh, w- it was a completely different situation. Uh, we were casting that, that role in Los Angeles. We read a lot of really good actors and the, the role, I, I, I mean, the, the actor I wrote it for was a character actor named Harry Dean Stanton mm-hmm. and he turned it down. And so uh, that kind of, we just, we're, I, I mean, we, we read tons of people, but nothing quite resonated. Then David happened to be at a restaurant and he saw Dennis Hopper and it, it you know, he was surprised he was still alive. I mean, <laughs> kind of disappeared through, um, it, it, I mean, dealing with drugs and alcohol and he'd been in, in and out of rehab and so on for a long time, hadn't appeared in any movies um, forever. And, uh, and, and Dennis, David went up and talked to him and started talking to him because it just popped in his mind. I mean, who would know more about alcoholism than a guy who's, you know, and, and Dennis had told him that he had been um, sober for a year and a half. Right. And, uh, and that he was looking to get back in the business and looking to get roles. And he was, um, um, was seriously in discussion with, um, with another uh, 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 great director, David Lynch, mm-hmm. uh, who Blue Velvet. So, uh, you know, but, but he hadn't been hired yet. So when we, he brought a, David invited to come in and have a conversation. And I just remember Dennis sitting down across from us and says, in a very kind of wide eyed, vulnerable way, I know this guy. <laughs> and you knew he really knew this guy. <laughs> so uh, we just felt uh, an electricity, uh, uh, you know, a connection with Dennis and, uh, and, 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 the only problem we had in casting him was the insurance company. You have to have an, you have to bond and get bonded to, to do a film. Right. Uh, and an insurance company didn't want to insure us because of him and his alcohol and his drugs and alcohol related incidents over the year. But we got, we got it through. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, David Lynch, I also hired him. So when he showed up on the set two weeks into shooting, he had just gotten off the plane working with, uh, David on Blue, and he played a character that uh, that many people thought he should be nominated for an Academy Award, but he ended up being nominated for, with our our uh, uh, with our character instead. But it's probably a probably a double thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, Dennis was was he had kind of worked through his darkness in a way. I mean, uh, he was upfront about his vulnerabilities and. And um, he has very hard. He was a very sweet guy. And, and be, because he had directed a number of movies, including Easy Rider, yeah. uh, an iconic film from the 70s, um, he got what we were doing. And he was tremendously supportive. He was there 100% for us. The only problem we had with Dennis is he couldn't remember lines. <laughs> he, too many brain cells had been burned out. <laughs> and... Uh, but sometimes, you know, there have been uh, there. It was the things he would come up with serendipitously. He would kind of get lost in the middle of a spiel or something, and he'd throw stuff in. And uh, we didn't ask him to improv improvise. But and afterwards, in a t- he'd always apologize. But sometimes it was really good stuff. Hmm. To give you an example, um, he's he finally has his he's got his shit together, and he's you know got on down on one knee, and he's 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 giving it. He's the assistant coach now made the main coach right. because uh, circumstances, obviously you, you saw the movie yep. and um, he's sitting there waiting to give them uh, a last instru- instruction. And what I wrote in the script, I'm blanking out now. I wrote another line, but he couldn't think of the line that I, I wrote and he, and he, and he, all the, he, I could see he was searching. He couldn't remember it and couldn't remember. It. He, he said, boys don't get caught watching the paint dry. And, and uh, I remember Dave and I were watching on the, mi- on the monitor. We looked at each other and said, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> we had no idea. And uh, Dennis came over. Oh, sorry. I forgot. I couldn't remember the line. I, and I said, what is, don't, don't get caught watching the paint dry. So what, what is, where did that come from? He said, my dad used to tell that to me all the time. You know, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, so I said, hey, it kind of works. Yeah. So the interesting thing is, there are now T-shirts you can buy with that line. You know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dennis has passed away, so we can't uh, 
we can't give him any kind of uh, pro. It's not my tea. I don't create the t-shirt. <laughs> Well, you talked about Gene Hackman uh, kind of coming from that small town environment and kind of understanding that. Um, that that's something I think that is captured so well in the movie. Um, I've spent a lot of time in those small towns and like I had a girlfriend in college that lived in Ligoti in the Jack Butcher days. And, you know, Ligoti's a lot like that. And we see it kind of in, in Barbara Hershey's character. She has kind of that disdain for basketball because of Jimmy's future yet she's in the stands for every game. Um, how important was it for you to show kind of that side of those small towns in Indiana? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that uh, I set out to do is to try to uh, create a tapestry of, of the, the culture mm -hmm. uh, and, and why, and not necessarily answering the question, but to portray the relationship of basketball to the small town, how it affected different people in different ways. And, you know, why was Indiana unique in that way? Again, it's not a question I really tried to answer, but um, uh, I tried to ultimately uh, create um, a, a, a positive spin on the basketball, so to speak, mm -hmm. basketball by, by showing that it was a unifying, uh, yep. a, a, a unifying element that would bring disparate parts of the community together uh, to pull for one thing. And, uh, you know, uh, especially in this day and age, it's, yeah. there's, not, there's not many things that work that way to bring us all together. Uh, and, and, I, and I think uh, that's why I tried to show, you know, various little pieces here and there, the, the, the rivalry between the different churches, you know, yeah. and that a lot of small towns and, uh, and, and how the two minister, one preacher and one minister uh, decided to, you know, uh, bring their, their disdain for each other and bring it together for the team. So again, it became a little bit of a metaphor, but I wanted to show how basketball uh, has been uh, not so much anymore a unifying element in bringing a community together and making it stronger. Right. Uh, a couple, couple, just a couple more questions about Hoosiers. Um, I think you've said in the past that that you and David weren't sure what this movie was going to do for your career <laughs> while making it. Uh, but when when did you know that you had something special? Well, we didn't know. Uh, let me say that we we our first cut was really long. Uh, it was like three and a half hours long. And then we started cutting like left and right in basketball. We came up with a cut that was two hours and 25 minutes long. And uh, which is at, at the time, it was really important to keep movies under two hours because mm -hmm. they, they wanted to get three screenings a night. And yeah. uh, uh, so uh, we knew it was gonna be a challenge, but we finally got, and we showed, we showed the film to a bunch of people. I mean, I, I mean, friends and some trusted uh, industry professionals and people were complimentary. I mean, but you don't know what, I mean, they, they were, uh, right. you, you never know. I don't care what anybody says. You never know until you get in front of an audience. Right. Because what happens is there is a synergy between the experience that you've created with your film and the audience that, that affects, that affects each other. And you'll find that, people laugh in places you never thought they were going to laugh. Sometimes good, sometimes not good. And, uh, and they would become connected to some characters more than others. Uh, uh, and it was not until that, and by the way, so we are uh, distributing, uh, the distribution company, Orion Films, um, told us that uh, we couldn't, every director gets one, uh, free test screening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, they told us that in our one test screening, it had to be under two hours. And um, I remember very distinctly, we came up with a cut that's two hours and 12 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and they, they wouldn't do it. But and then David went to the DGA. And the DGA called them up and said, you have to, you, you know, it's not just that the director gets a cut. They get their also a screening, a free screening. They get it at their whatever length they want. So they had to go forward with this. 
and we we uh, we screened it in a southern you know again because it's so indiana centric midwest centric we didn't know how a shopping mall audience and that's what they they usually are so it was a, a a theater in Irvine, California, Southern Orange County. Uh, and the way you get, you recruit uh, the, the people who watch it are it's part of a shopping center. They hand out flyers where well, you want to see a free movie and they'll describe it, you know, Midwest basketball, whatever. So 200 people have no idea what they're going to see. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, uh, they're just random, randomly shopping. And, right. Irvine shopping mall. And, uh, I, I knew that was, that was a time that Dave and I said to each other, what happens in the screen will determine maybe the rest of our lives. And, right. uh, it certainly will determine the, the rest of the, of, of the movie's life yeah. because this, this company distribution company did not want to release it nationally. They were not interested in doing that. They didn't finance it. It was, um, it was a politically difficult um, situation. Right. They didn't love the. They didn't think that there would be much appeal uh, to it outside of the state of Indiana, and uh, so uh, the the screening was a spectacular success. And it was like uh, I remember, you know, when people stood up at the end of the movie and started cheering. I was Dave and I were weeping. We were just yeah. totally. Weeping. We knew we had something because people responded to that film in such a visceral way and in the way in which we wanted to, even more than we wanted to. Again, we mentioned, we did, I didn't realize the movie is so funny, you know, yeah. people <laughs> laughing in places that, and it was okay for the most part. And uh, it was, uh, it, it, I remember the, because the, we, the president of Orion Pictures met us outside, shook his head and he said, that was the highest score Orion pictures has had in a test screening in the last 15 years wow and, and it was like uh he said okay here's the deal because we were also fighting him on the title he hated the title hoosiers he wanted it called the last shot part in part because it translated better to hoosiers was not translatable to uh, different languages uh, uh worldwide so um i remember he said something to uh to us, congratulations! I never saw that coming. And uh, <laughs> and all right, here's the deal: you can have your title. You have to you, but I'm not going to let you release it at this length, even it worked like gangbusters. You're <laughs> going to release it for less than two. It has to be less than two hours. And the third thing was, I, I here's what I want to do: I want to release it in Indiana only. And if we don't do well there, we're not getting a national release. So that's when we knew, well, if they don't like this in Indiana and they love it in Irvine, something's wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, were, we were actually worried about that. Uh, it was a concern of ours because we thought, well, maybe they are looking at this like uh, Irvine people are looking at like this. Uh, this is like a French comedy or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> so cults are really different from, uh, from who they are. Um, and then, uh, you know, there was a lot of pushback in Bloomington, Indiana uh, on breaking away. There was a lot of people, and I understand because I had an issue with breaking away myself in one regard, the casting. Those, I, I know the people of Bloomington. I know the people who live around Bloomington who are ostensibly called the Cutters. Mm -hmm. Those aren't those people that they cast, you know, that right. they, they aren't that Southern, you know, Indiana uh, Hoosier. Uh, and uh, they, they were, they were, they were like, and, and it's understandable. The guy who uh, who uh, directed the film uh, had uh, uh, Peter Yates, I believe. I don't think he'd ever heard of the state of Indiana. Oh wow! Uh, he took the job. Well, he's British, and uh, you know, so he he didn't have any he didn't have any need to connect the characters, the actors to the the, the location and the culture. It wasn't his interest. And, and I get that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just know that, you know, the father who was the mill cutter, uh, that nothing at all like the, <laughs> that's nothing like the mill, the, the stone millers, uh, the stone cutters rather that I knew in Bedford and Bloomington, right. Uh, not the right accent, nothing about it. it. It just, it was just an odd combination. I make this point where 
that, that nobody outside of Bloomington would have noticed these things or cared. And, and it didn't really affect the movie or whether the movie worked or not, because it worked great. Mm-hmm. But we thought that we might get that hypercritical look from people from this state and, and, and they, they would say, well, you know, that would never happen here. Or that, I, I don't believe that care, whatever. So we were actually really, really worried. We, we were not, we did not think we had it in the bag after that Irvine screen. We thought we might have it in the bag nationally. We didn't think we had it in the bag uh, just in, in Indiana though. Right. Well, does it, uh, I guess how special is it and, or does it surprise you that, you know, 34 years later, people are taking trips to the gym just to kind of step out on the court and be in the middle of, of where it all happened. I think that the best way of putting it is that, uh, um, when I wrote the script, I knew it was a tremendous long shot that it would ever get made only because of the, the numbers. The numbers are there are over a hundred thousand screenplays registered at the Writers Guild every year in Los Angeles. That doesn't even count New York, and uh, and you know less than two or three hundred get made. The, the second part was once we got got it, uh, the, we got the money and the green light. We felt while we were making it that we were on the precipice of disaster every step of the way. And, and part of it was we just didn't have the experience of making movies. We did face all sorts of weather problems, budget problems. It, and, and it was and not to speak of showing up at Hinkle Fieldhouse and no one showed up. No one was there. And uh, then then we get to uh, that cut and they still don't want to release it nationally. They still don't believe in it. And and. So we're thinking they may be right. They know more than, than we do. So mm. we're thinking no one may ever see this movie except the people in Indiana. And so the fact, uh, and, and obviously 98% of movies that, that are released are kind of released, uh, especially back then. They, they come out, they have their moment in the sun and three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks later, they're gone and you never think about them again unless you watch them on television many years later. They don't live on in the culture. Most films don't live on in, in uh, popular culture. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you look at the vast number of movies made every year, maybe maybe a handful, maybe 20, you know, sustain uh, in popular culture. So the fact that we've had two movies that, that, that have sustained in popular culture is beyond shocking. It, you know, I, I just don't know how it even happened. It just, uh, uh, we, we're so lucky. We are so lucky. That's, uh, yeah. you know, it was just great fortune. Well, you talked about that. You followed up uh, Hoosiers with Rudy uh, several years later. Um, what was kind of the difference for you in writing that, that script where you were staying a little more true to that original story than you did in Hoosiers? Yeah, I, I mean, there were a couple of things. I had a little more confidence, you know, uh, although, you know, you never find altogether the kind of confidence. I mean, I'm I'm about to sit down and write my 38th script and I'm still terrified I'm not going to be able to. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I would say that I was, when I was writing Rudy, I was a little more, I knew I would get to, it's almost like, deciding to become a mountain climber and never having climbed a mountain. That's where I was with Hoosiers. With Mm -hmm. Rudy, I knew it was another mountain and it was going to be different than Hoosiers, but I already climbed a tough one. So I I felt more confident I could get to the top. Um, How it would look and, and, and what would happen was something else, of course. And every, 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 uh, every script, every movie is different, but uh, in order in, to tell a true story, I had to find what I considered the right balance between um, what really happened. And um, I, I, went, I, was, I, I was very cognizant, very aware that I'm not making a documentary. Right. Um, I, I just didn't need to cover every little piece of Rudy's life. And then I had to kind of make a determination about where I could invent, where I could composite characters uh, where I could um, um, where I could take something that was 
factually true and enhance it uh, in a way to make it uh, more dramatic without violating, uh, you know, some basic um, uh, axiom, which I learned to live by. This is what this what it, the axiom was that someone, a really gifted screenwriter was asked this very question. How do you determine when you're writing a true story um, what to invent and what to maintain truthfulness about? Mm -hmm. and, and his axiom was a takeoff on the legal axiom, which is um, my attempt at every step of the way was to maintain fidelity to the spirit of the truth, if not the letter of the truth. Right. Uh, substituting <laughs> truth law for truth. Um, and uh, so I, I, I feel very comfortable that, that I never did anything that would violate that spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, even to the point of, we, the, we made this movie for TriStar and there was an executive who actually said, just making the tackle at the very end, you know, this doesn't seem spectacular enough. Could he do something where it actually made a difference in how the game turns out? And I would say I would never make that movie. You know, yeah. that was that'd be a complete, you know, violation of the spirit of the truth um, and the letter of the truth, obviously. So I did the character of, of for example, the character of uh, Forrest, who was the groundskeeper, was a combination of three different people who worked with, who, who helped Rudy along the way. Okay. He actually did... Um, um, was given the key to um, a, a kind of a broom closet to, to live in that first year, uh, just like the character in the movie. Uh, but it was a janitor who worked in the basketball arena. Uh, and then he actually got to know a groundskeeper who helped him um, get in. He could get into the field anytime. And he kind of ran around and helped in the field. So I just thought it was natural to combine those, those two characters. And then, then there was another character as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, one of the bigger elements uh, about this, this uh, people bring this, this one scene up more than any other scene, sometimes, sometimes critically and sometimes uh, in a positive way. Uh, and that's the jersey scene when they, they laid the jerseys on the table. Well, um, what, what happened in real life was that um, a number of the seniors uh, who knew what Rudy put into it uh, and knew that Rudy uh, was promised uh, by Era Parsegian to dress for one game his senior year. And uh, Devine didn't feel, uh, uh, the, the coach Devine did not feel obligated to that promise. Uh, these seniors went to the defensive coordinator and offered up their jerseys. Uh, you know, can, can I, can Rudy please dress for me. I don't need to, I'm not going to be playing. So can he, so you could please, uh, you know, go run out there in the field like you right. worked hard for. So that's what really happened. And I thought, you know, just one person after another caught, caught talking to the defensive coordinator. Uh, it was, it, it wasn't, I wanted to create a visual correlative, something that was, that created the, that what really happened but in a little more dramatic way, I kind of turned up the knob. So I made it the head coach, Divine, and I decided to rather than just people speaking it, that they would actually bring their jerseys in. Right. And uh, so I think that probably exemplifies, you know, how I, I work certain truths in a different kind of way. Yeah. Well, Rudy is such a beloved movie, and uh, I know you've mentioned this in the past. A lot of people probably don't realize that uh, it was – not a great success at the box office. Um, were, was there a period in time where you guys thought, you know, kind of worried it might be a forgotten film? Well, um, we, we just assumed it would be a forgotten film. Um, yeah. you know, it, it, it was, it, it, uh, you know, Hoosiers was more successful out of the gate and in terms of being released. Think about this and how times were different in 1980 seven when Hoosiers was released we were in the theaters for over six months well there's no movie in the planet that would be a <laughs> movie screen probably more than six weeks now right right so uh, and we we, we end up being in the top 10 of uh, domestic uh, gross receipts uh, but with Rudy we 
we uh, it wasn't a very good marketing campaign, uh, and uh, it just didn't click for people to come and see the movie in the theater, and for you know one reason or another. Uh, but uh, so we kind of just we knew that that's and our we our re reviews were not great either. Uh, reviews for Hoosiers are probably a little better. I think our, if you if there was such thing as Rotten Tomatoes then, and you can't talk about it now because people review Hoosier, uh, Rudy from a different perspective now than they sure, did. Then. Sure. I'm talking about when they first came out, it'd be under 50%. Yeah. So um, we were pretty, uh, the fact that it was, it did not do well at the box office. We just thought it would just, you know, uh, we kind of thought about, well, let's, well, that was, we really worked hard and, and that's, you know, too bad. And what's next? You know, we were working on our next movies and, uh, and David had a job, I had a job. So I, I, I never considered, I just thought it was going to be buried in the dustbin of, uh, you know, movies like it. Uh, and uh, maybe it would be on, on a, on a, on a late show one time, <laughs> you know, some, some, uh, you know, old, when the uh, movie, old movie channel theater or <laughs> old, old movie channel. Right. But, um, so what, what, uh, what happened was uh, a phenomena that was only likely back then, uh, which was that I uh, remember how blockbuster used to be so mm -hmm. big, the blockbuster yeah. video rentals and later DVD rentals. Uh, and, and that was a whole subculture and a whole world that really was a, uh, was a tremendous boon for the film business because um, people who didn't want to lay out, you know, however many dollars for a movie could get get rent the the video or the DVD for two or three bucks and bring it home. And uh, I remember when when Rudy came out, uh, it was usually it was like two three months after the release of the film, and it was on it was on like two or three shelves at my local blockbuster. And um, after about a month, it take, took up an, almost an entire section. So uh, the demand for it, it was always gone. Uh, it became what they called at that time, a blockbuster hit. So people started finding the movie on a video and DVD. Right. And, and, and weirdly enough, it slowly, slowly built and uh, and and it was uh, in, in ways in which David and I were shocked, and we never never believed it could have happened. Now I'll give you a perfect example. Um, USA Today and Los Angeles Times did a um, um, uh, I think it was actually USA Today. It was back in in 1998 or 99. Um, it was about four or five years after uh, Rudy came came out and listed the top football movies of all time. And I mean, there were probably only 30 and we didn't, I think we barely made the top 20. Um, and I think we're number 19 or something. And uh, that, you know, didn't surprise us. We, we thought that's kind of how people thought of it as, uh, you know, critically and otherwise. Um, they did the same thing this year, a top movie this, this past year. It was like 2019. Mm -hmm. Rudy was number one. Wow! So that's that, that's how <laughs> the, the reputation um, of it has has uh, has increased. You know, and people now they they say Rudy is now a word in our language. You know, mm -hmm. he's another Rudy. People know it. People when somebody says he's another Rudy, uh, you know what he means. Yeah. So who Definitely. knew? <laughs> yeah. Right. So uh, you mentioned a little earlier, but, uh, you know, a few years ago, you'd uh, go on to write and direct uh, My All-American. Um, I know you said, you've said in pre previous interviews that directing wasn't completely foreign to you because you'd done some second unit stuff with Hoosiers and Rudy. Um, but, but what was kind of the new uh, twist to, to the job when uh, you took on that role? Yeah, so what what I what it wasn't just that I directed second unit. The way David and I worked together making movies, we kind of worked as a team making decisions that were creative decisions, um, having to do with um, casting, 
production design, wardrobe, props, so on and so forth. And a lot of times David just said, look, I don't have time. Just you go pick out the uniform. You know, you, you take care of this area. I'll take care of this area. Right. Uh, and, and so, it, it, yeah, in many ways, I, and doing pre-production for My All American, I felt like I'd have been there a hundred times before. I felt like, I mean, I knew what to do. I knew I'd make a decision and, and um, I knew what I wanted. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just about communication. Mm -hmm. What was different uh, and, and what David was very good at, I mean, were two things. One, uh, David was great at um, uh, just creating a beautiful frame. His sure. dad, was a cinematographer, or his dad was a photographer and David had a great eye, knew how to, block and set and, 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 um, you know, uh, he, he knew how to make scenes kind of like, uh, uh, he needed, knew where to find the, the air and the space and the emotion and scenes. And that's not always on the page, you know, it comes between the energy of, of the actors that you find in rehearsing. So that was one, one area which I was new at. And the other was communicating with actors. I was uh, um, a little nervous about that because every actor comes from different schools of training uh, and have their, have their own language. And uh, it's important to create an environment of safety and support for actors uh, to know that you, you have their back because they create uh, a very vulnerable spaces for themselves when they're acting. Um, and, and I just, I, I was lucky to have a week of rehearsal for my all American and mm -hmm. uh, and I had some very uh, deep discussions uh, about with the actors and I got some, you know, we worked together on scenes, but, but my most important aspect, most, most important part of that time was finding out where, uh, where I could be of help and where we could work together and that we went through every scene and, and every line of dialogue um, and, and to, to, to make sure that we are all on the same page. And so by the time we got to the set, a lot of those questions and, and a lot of the, the kinds of, of, of situations that could arise that could cause problems were averted by those early rehearsal times. Uh, right. But I, again, I was never totally comfortable until I did it. And then once right. I, did that, you know, I felt like secondhand. Yeah. I, I shouldn't say that I never had worked with actors before because I had, because the way in which David and I worked uh, pr uh, primarily was that I was in charge of the script. You know, if anybody had a problem, any actor had an issue with the scene or the, a line uh, uh, or the character development or growth or arc, um, that they should come and talk to me. So I had, um, I had a lot of uh, really uh, great relationships with actors talking about the part and the role. Uh, so I understood languaging at that time. I understood actors language and how they would, how actors training would shape and shift uh, the way in which they communicated their thoughts, their ideas and their desires. Right. Uh, just for example, you, you haven't mentioned a third movie we made called The Game of Their Lives, which was a soccer movie that that was a, a bomb when I could talk about that at great, great length. Uh, <laughs> and, but uh, the actor in charge was, uh, was uh, I mean, it, it, the lead actor was Gerard Butler. Jerry Butler. And, uh, and when David said, um, go talk to Angela, if you have any problems with the script, he came to me every day. He had issues with, I mean, this, he's like a, a former lawyer. And uh, I mean, he drove me nuts, but it was really, <laughs> but, but in a good way, because he challenged me to think about, and, um, you know, we would have great debates, but we both had great respect for each other. And we, we finally, um, um, we find we found a way to work that was really helpful and beneficial to both of us, and and I'll give you an example of how well we we clicked in this in our own our own dialogue and finding his character, and that was there was a big scene where he had to give a locker room speech, so to speak, uh, you know, to fire up his boys before the big game at the end, and um, and I had kind of I I had written a version of it that I knew wasn't great. It was just kind of a placeholder. And I told Jerry at the time, look, there's this one section, this one great last speech. It kind of, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it has to work. It's daunting. It's difficult. 
Um, it, it's, you know, you live in the land of cliche. It's so cliched, you know, locker room speeches, firing yeah. people up. And, um, and, and I, and I, and I think, and, and I, I threw this challenge at him. I said, by the end, this is one of the last scenes we were shooting. We were in Rio de, de Janeiro. I said, by, by this time, you should know your character better than I know him. Right. Okay. So let me propose something. I'm going to write a new version of that locker room speech. I'm going to give it to you and I want you to rewrite it as your character would say, then you're going to give it back to me. Then I'm going to rewrite you. And then I'm going to give it to you and you're going to rewrite me. And then on the, the fifth iteration of this, we will, we will find the best version of it. And that's exactly what happened. So. Nice. Um, it's interesting, interesting way to kind of process that. So, um, in, in, in my all American, you have the story of, um, uh, Freddie Steinmark, of course, who's played amazing casting with Finn Whitrock. I mean, they look so similar. Um, and I wasn't really familiar with that story, uh, going in, but, uh, it's just a, it's a sad story yet inspiring the, the work he did. Uh, it's kind of one of those guys that make you question how good a person you are. Um, so how, how was it to work on that project and how important was it to you to kind of tell that story? Well, I was offered the story and, and the thing that uh, the, my most difficult challenge with Freddie, uh, it, it was uh, in the Freddie story was he was just almost too good. You know, yeah. he was, it's hard to root for a character without flaws yeah. Um, you know, the, the, and, and, uh, you know, nobody loves Mr. Perfects and, 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 and he was kind of that guy, you know? And so I had to do a really deep dive into kind of his, who he was and where he came from and, and what, what his life was, you know, as, as a kid in high school. And, and I found some interesting things that were not all perfect, like his relationship with his father. And um, it was uh, um, it was very loving and very close, but uh, his father was very demanding, very it was, and and very critical. Um, and he was on Freddie all the time. Uh, I, to give you an example, uh, you know, Freddie had uh, like one game in high school. He had five touchdowns and and three interceptions, and and he but he fumbled the ball twice. And when he got home, his dad just ripped him up one side down the other for fumbling to the point where they actually got into a fist fight. Uh, wow. So I thought this is a great way to go. But in order to, to make the movie, we, um, we, we, uh, we had to get the permission of the Steinmark family. And uh, that wasn't going to fly. I, yeah. I, couldn't, I, couldn't take, I couldn't take it dark. I couldn't take it dark. I was also... Uh, I was asked to make sure the movie be PG. So uh, it's a lighter, even though it's a tragedy and inspiring. Um, the other films that we've made are much darker. And I yeah. probably would have chosen a darker palette if I, it, I was involved in different circumstances <clears throat> where um, I, I could invent a lot more than I did. Um, but, the, you know, the family was in, in very, very much involved in... in uh, the, the script had to pass, you know, we had to pass approval of the family and, and, and the, the people making the film wanted to make sure it's a PG movie. So sure. those, those are my two restrictions, but I did the best job I could. And, uh, and I tried to get some darkness in there, but, you know, before <laughs> the tragedy uh, struck. So, you know, listen, every script, every project has their challenges and there are obstacles everywhere you go. It's just not uh, not something I complain about ever. It's just, it's just the hand you're dealt. You, you try to make the, the best out of what you're given. Right. Well, I want to thank you for talking uh, about your career some, and a couple more questions before we get out of here that are kind of just general sports movies, movie questions. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan. I've, I've always thought as an actor, Kevin Costner is one of the, the great sports film actors that uh, is out there and, and uh, putting work in to deliver that medium. Um, as another kind of icon of the sports movie, what, what are some of your favorite sports movies over the years? 
Yeah, people always ask this question, and it's uh, it, it, it's um, I I I I know how to answer the the question, but it's been the same answer for about twenty years, and that's because I don't watch sports movies. Okay. I, I, I can't. I can't. If I know there's a coach and I know the coach is going to give a locker room speech, I cannot, I cannot begin to watch that movie. I, it's almost like asking a farmer, you know, who tills a field to go in and enjoy the field, you okay. know, in some way. I, I mean, it's just, I know the architecture, I know the, the choices. I just can't let go and just let it wash over me. I, I was, I was told I must see the new Ben Affleck movie about he's a coach. And I said, Oh God, I'd rather, I'd rather watch anything than that. Uh, and nothing against Ben. And I'm, I'm sure it's a fine movie. So, um, but uh, let's say uh, probably raging bull uh, would be okay. number one. Um, uh, I, I would say bull Durham is up there. Uh, you know, Ron Shelton is a friend of mine. He, he's, he's a good writer. Uh, and uh, uh, Field of Dreams, although uh, I, I will say that the, my uh, Field of Dreams is, is, is an unusual movie. And so far as when I watched it, I remember thinking about three quarters of the way through, I wasn't really, it was like, I wasn't really with it. It just seemed like there were too many storylines going through it at the same time. And mm -hmm. I wasn't really, where's this all going? What's it, is this all about? I, I, I just didn't, just didn't connect to me. And then all of a sudden there at the end, and in part it was that beautiful, you know, surprising connection between father and son when they asked to put a catch. And, and then just a, a phenomenal score, a film score by uh, James Horner. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was like, you know, when they pulled up and away, Bill, did they come and the, 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 the lights for all the cars coming? I just started weeping. I was like, yeah. you know, any, any movie can make me cry. I'm not a big fire, you know, that, that, that filmmaker has done a job. They've yeah. done a good job. So, you know, I don't really know how much of a, why that's called a sports movie. There's not very much sport, many sports no. sports in it, but right. uh, if people want to lump it that way, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in my top five. Okay. <laughs> Those are kind of three unique choices that are kind of get away from that locker room talk, you know, there at the end. So, um, you know, with the, with these movies, I've always thought that, uh, the reason why people love them is that we kind of see the human side of the athlete that we may not get to see with, you know, a LeBron James or, or some big star uh, every day. Uh, why do you think people connect with these movies so much? Well, it's always about the characters, you know, and, and they, they say that the successful movies uh, in, in, in uh, popular culture are dependent on the perfect combination of the universal and the unique. And that is, uh, there have to be uh, enough uh, uh, enough things that a character is going through as experiencing uh, challenging his challenges, his emotional emotional obstacles, uh, et cetera, that just about anybody can relate to them. At the same time, you have to create a world uh, and, and a, maybe situations that make you feel like you've never seen it before, even, even though you have. And, and that, that, that was the, probably the greatest compliment that we got in Hoosiers was um, a, uh, from an LA Times critic uh, who was writing for uh, GQ at the time. And he described Hoosiers as getting on a train where you knew the destination and you, you were pretty sure how, it, what this countryside was going to look like and, and how you're going to get there. And then being on the train and and seeing it for the first make they the filmmakers make you make you feel like you've never seen it before, even though it's very familiar. And I think that's really the secret to working in in uh, you know uh, mass culture. I think mm -hmm. and being successful is yeah. creating an existing genre or story form and making it feel fresh, making it feel unique, and make it feel new, even though you know, it's not. So, um, and that's one of the problems we had with getting Hoosiers made was um, people couldn't reduce the story to a log line that would go either on a poster or, you know, advertisement and make people feel like it was interesting enough. I mean, if you right. reduce Hoosiers to, to one or two lines, uh, uh, you know, a down and out coach goes to a small town and 
whips the boys into shape and they end up being successful or winning state championship. It was like, I don't think I'd go see that movie. Right. It feels like one big cliche. And um, uh, so, uh, the, you know, that, that's, that's, that's one element uh, of, of it. Uh, what was the question? Because I, I think that you, uh, you know, I, I was just kind of asking like why you think people connect with these sports oh, movies oh, so I much. I know. The other thing is that um, uh, I remember, I remember I put, I had a sign up on my computer when I wrote the script, this is not a sports movie. It's never about the sports. Anytime a sports movie is about the sport and really focuses too much on the sport, then you lose the characters. Right. The greatest compliment that we got that we still get from like Rudy is, you know what? I saw that movie and it made me cry. And guess what? Not only do I not like football, not only do I not like, like Notre Dame, I don't even like sports. Right. And yet I connected to it and made me cry. And that's what, that's, what's important when, in working in the genre is that you reach that person that you're not just, you're not just doing this film for, you know, Notre Dame football fans, you know, or, or Indiana basketball fans, you're, you're doing it for people who could care less. So it's always about the characters. That, right. That's the secret. It's about their characters and their journey. And then a similar, a similar vein, I have a friend that's, uh, that won't watch Hoosiers because he's from Kentucky. And I said, don't think of it as <laughs> the Hoosiers you root against. <laughs> so, Yeah, it's not connected to Indiana University. Right. <laughs> so my final question. Um, I will say I wouldn't watch anything that said Wildcats. It was about a high school basketball team in Kentucky. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my final question, I, I used to live in uh, New Harmony, Indiana, and I know you used to work a little bit with the New Harmony Writers Project. And um, so I, I appreciate, you know, the work you do to kind of give back to the community in Indiana, Southern Indiana. What is your, like a best piece of advice you could give a writer that's trying to work on their craft? Uh, never give the power away to other people to tell you what is what you can and you can't do. And, and one of the biggest mistakes I made when I wrote Hoosiers is I, uh, I wrote this first draft. And of course, I, if you, you write with any truth and on it, well, I don't care what, how you describe it. There's no possible way to be objective about your own work. You cannot know whether um, you've accomplished what you set out to do, whether it's any good or not. I mean, I, when I finished Hoosiers, I, entertain the possibility that it was terrible, that it was embarrassing. Uh, and the first person I gave it to was the person I respected the most and trusted the most, who was a big time producer, who gave me my first job out of film school and trained me um, basically. So I thought, this is a guy who knows the language. He's going he's gonna to be able to tell me the truth about this. And he read it and he said it was a piece of garbage and it was that I, that I should go back and now never write again. And um, I took his word for it. And I took that um, script and I threw it in the back of my closet and I never let anybody read it, including David for more than a year. Yeah. And I happened to be sitting at a dinner party next to um, a guy who was a, who had just won a Pulitzer prize for his biography of, of Charles Lindbergh. It was, <clears throat> To tell the story correctly, he hadn't won the Pulitzer Prize yet. He had won the American Book Award for a biography of Maxwell Perkins. And he had just finished a book on Sam Goldwyn. He was about to write the, the, um, the Lindbergh book for which he was going to, which he did win the Pulitzer Prize. However, um, uh, he was somebody I had tremendous respect for, uh, obviously a, a great writer, an intellectual, and his dad was a big time producer and his brother was right, ran the biggest uh, agency in, in the business, uh, ICM at the time. And, um, you know, we started talking and he told me that he thought I had the sensibility of a writer, which kind of surprised me. And then I admitted to him that I had once written something, mm -hmm. but it was so terrible. I never let anybody else read it. And, and he said, you, you let one person decide whether something, something you wrote was good or bad. Um, and, uh, he, it became a big drawn out thing between the two of us 
uh, about him wanting to read it. And ultimately I broke down and let him read it. And um, I, I, uh, and he called me up and said, this is, a, there's a great movie in here. You know, it, it's long, but there's, I'll help you edit it. And so he helped me kind of cut it down. It was 180 pages. Most scripts are 120. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so um, I, one of the things that I, uh, I think was drawn to with the movie Rudy was the fact that Rudy never allowed anybody to tell him what he could or couldn't do, what was possible or not possible. He never gave away his power. So I think for any writer out there, you know, d don't, don't, even if you give it to a bunch of trusted critics, don't let them, if you believe in it, if there's something that means something to you, you're going to find some, somebody else who's going to believe in it too. Right. Um, and, you know, there is such a thing as craft and, um, and there is such a thing. I mean, if people can give you honest responses, uh, helpful responses, if you have an intention of trying to accomplish something and, and, and it doesn't work, then, then the craftsman side of uh, a person you give it to can help you realize that. Um, but uh, don't let negative criticism get in the way of moving forward. Um, the second thing about, uh, you know, writers write. Um, uh, tons of people talk about writing and uh, tons of people talk about what they're going to write next. Mm -hmm. But true writers write every day. And that's yeah. what I would say. The, the, the advantage for being a writer as opposed to just about anything else in the business is that you control that. Um, you know, actors can't get up and act. Directors can't get up and, and, and direct. Producers can't get up and produce. But writers can get up every day and write. And uh, sometimes you got to, you know, you got to, uh, one of the most successful writers in the, in the film business, Larry Kasdan, who has Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, Star Wars movies, on and on. Um, uh, I got to know him early on. He was working for an advertising agency in Los Angeles. He'd get up every morning uh, at like five o'clock and write for two hours before he went to work. Right. And he wrote, I believe, eight screenplays before anybody read anything that would caught their attention. Wow. But he never stopped writing. And I yeah. think that's, that's critical. You know, you need material. Don't sink everything into one, one deal, one script. It may not be the perfect fit. Uh, you know, there is such a thing as the, um, the, the bias of primary experience. Just because you lived it, you, you know, it made you cry, it made you weep, made you laugh, made you feel all these emotions. Maybe that's not necessarily what you should write, but you should write a variation of that. Put it a step, step, be one step removed still feel those feelings, but um, do it in a way in which uh, you can, you can combine, you know, those, those, those left brain and right brain, yeah. you know, your different chakras. I think the best writers write from all the chakras. Mm -hmm. They write from their head, their neck, their heart, their stomach, et cetera. Um, and you have to be able to be open to not intellectualizing what you're writing uh, and not writing just uh, to, uh, you know, whatever, you, whatever comes out of your gut and your heart. I mean, there's certain kinds of writing where that can work. I mean, but if you're talking about film writing, no, you know, you, it's, it's much more rigorous. Right. Well, that's great advice. Um, I want, I want to thank you so much for the career you've had and, and the joy you've, you've given to so many of us that have watched your films. And uh, I especially want to thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with me. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later.